Imagine you're giving your friend a ride, and they ask you to drop them off in a part of the city you've never driven to before. You turn on the navigation on your smartphone, as any of us would. But have you ever wondered how navigation works? Yes, it has something to do with satellites. But how on earth did people used to find their way centuries ago? To answer this question, we must look at the globe, like the one you had in elementary school. You'll notice it has lines that cross it vertically and horizontally. The horizontal lines, also called parallels, represent latitude. How north or south you are from the equator, which is at zero degrees latitude. The zero parallel, which divides the Earth into the northern and southern hemispheres, is so important that the country of Ecuador in South America was named after it. Determining one's latitude is pretty easy, as Polynesians were among the first to discover it in the year 400 CE. All you need to determine your latitude is the sky and the stars, or more precisely, the North Star, that is, Polaris. It is always positioned directly above the North Pole, as Earth rotates on its axis from west to east. All you need to do is determine how high in the sky the North Star is. At the equator, it's at zero degrees, or at the horizon, the place where Earth and sky meet. At the North Pole, it's directly above your head, at 90 degrees. If you're in New York, then the North Star is 41 degrees above the northern horizon. The angle is measured with the help of instruments, like a sextant or an astrolabe. But knowing how north or south from the equator you are still doesn't tell you where exactly on Earth you're located. For navigation purposes, vertical lines on the globe, called meridians, are much more important. They represent longitude and tell you how east or west from Greenwich you are. Greenwich is a borough of London, and it was chosen as the prime meridian because the British established the Royal Observatory there in 1851. They were pioneers in astronomy at that time. In theory, the prime meridian can be anywhere on the globe, so for a short period, the French set it in Paris and the Chinese placed it in Beijing. An international convention in 1884 finally set for the whole world the prime meridian in Greenwich. Now we get to the tricky part, how to determine your longitude on a planet that is constantly spinning. Since all the stars in the sky keep moving, you cannot rely on them to tell you where exactly you are. But the problem is, at the same time, the solution. You need to know when you are instead of where you are. The ancient Greek astronomer Ptolemy was among the first to suggest that longitude can be measured by tracking how far in time you've traveled east or west from your starting point. In antiquity and the Middle Ages, it was common practice to measure distance in time rather than in mileage. Marco Polo, for example, gave the size of lands he traveled on the Silk Road in days, not miles. It takes our planet 24 hours to complete a full 360 degrees rotation around its axis. Broken into individual hours, Earth rotates 15 degrees every hour. This means that if you know that it is noon in London and your local time says it's 4 in the morning, then there are roughly 8 hours of difference between you and Greenwich time. Multiply those 8 hours by 15 the number of degrees Earth rotates every hour, and you get the number 120, which places you somewhere at the California-Nevada state border, depending on your latitude. According to the Constitution of California, the 120th meridian west was the primary guideline for drawing that border in the first place. Today, this seems simple enough, as we can find out times in different places using a simple Google search. To make things easier, the whole world was divided into time zones during the 1960s, so there is no longer the need for complicated math. Navigation was all but simple up until the 18th century. Ships sometimes sailed through the thick fog, or the sky was simply cloudy, making it hard to determine latitude. It was even more complicated to determine longitude at sea. Sailors could figure out the local time by looking at the mast pole, when it didn't cast a shadow on the deck below, that meant the sun was at its highest point in the sky and that it was noon. But telling time in London was more complicated, 
as clocks of the era still couldn't tell time at sea. Pendulum clocks didn't work because of the motion waves created and mechanical clocks with springs were too sensitive to changes in air temperature and pressure. They would constantly speed up, slow down, or stop working altogether, making them useless for precisely determining longitude. Sailors would find their way by studying nautical charts, magnetic compasses, and carefully tracking their ship's direction and speed. But this wasn't enough, so navigational errors were common. This is how the worst naval disaster in British history happened in October of 1707, when a fleet of 21 ships that were sailing home hit the rocks off the Isles of Scilly. Nearly 2,000 men lost their lives in a single day as the fleet's commander, Sir Cloudley Shovel, who had 43 years of experience in the Navy, simply couldn't determine the ship's precise location due to bad weather. After this unfortunate event, the British authorities were determined to do something. They launched the Longitude Prize in 1714, setting the reward of £20,000, close to $6 million in today's money to anyone who solved the issue of navigation at sea. The man with the solution was John Harrison, a clockmaker from Yorkshire, England. In 1755, after several attempts, he turned in a pocket-sized chronometer simply named H4. It was based on a spring made from a new type of steel that allowed the clock to be so precise that it didn't lose more than one second after spending a month at sea. Even today's high-range, Swiss-made watches aren't that accurate. This breakthrough in timekeeping technology enabled the British to truly rule the seas in the decades to come. And thanks to it, today we are able to pinpoint our location anywhere on the globe using satellites, as they work using similar technology. While orbiting the Earth, GPS satellites send out time-coded radio messages that are picked up by receivers like the ones inside our smartphones. The receiver then compares our local time to the time the message was sent. Based on the speed the light the signal traveled at, it calculates our exact distance from that satellite. For this calculation to be accurate though, we need three of four satellites for maximum precision. When a GPS device calculates its distance from one satellite, it cannot determine from which direction the radio signal was sent. If we think of this signal as a beam of light shining down on Earth, it creates a circle, and we could be located anywhere inside it. When several satellites create these circles that overlap, it's easier to pinpoint our location. Such a method of geolocation is called trilateration. Some GPS receivers are so accurate that they can determine our location within 0.4 inches. Apart from latitude and longitude, they also deliver information on our altitude, our vertical distance from sea level. Getting all this information was made possible after we finally figured out the connection between time and location. Our knowledge of the universe is still expanding as Einstein's theory of relativity provided new insights into how GPS satellites work. Since gravity makes clocks on Earth run at a slower rate than the ones mounted on satellites in outer space, we must take this effect into account. If we didn't, the small differences in time would make it impossible to determine our exact position on Earth. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.